You know, America has been defined and influenced by a lot of things over the years. But one thing that comes to mind when I think about America's influence is the church. The church has influenced America. We've seen it. In God we trust. Those words showed up on the American coin in 1864. In God we trust. In 1956, the government thought it was a good idea to make that the national motto. In God we trust. We started seeing that on all kinds of currency. In fact, in 2006, on the 50th anniversary of this national motto, the Senate reaffirmed this, that we were going to continue on. In fact, in 2011, the House of Representatives affirmed this by voting for it 396 votes to 9. According to 2003, when they took a poll, 90% of Americans backed this saying, and God we trust. They believed it. They didn't mind it being on the currency. But in a recent poll of a different nature, it was asked this question. At the present time, do you think the church as a whole is influencing the American life or losing its influence? In that poll, 72% said we believe that the church is losing its influence in the American life. 22% said, no, we believe that it's still influencing the American life. And 6% said, we don't know or we don't care. So what do we do with these statistics? You know, America is about freedom. Nobody would argue that. But in the land of the free, what have we done with our religious freedoms? If this is such an important statement in God we trust, then why is not the church as strong as it once was. What has happened? You know, we fight for freedom in America. That's what we do. Many have given their lives to provide the freedom for this country. And what do we do with that freedom? You know, we have a, a place now where we have freedom to have a voice. And you know, the church, it once had a strong voice in America. It really did. That church voice in America, I believe, has faded and is continuing to fade. Do you realize that when you look back in history, there wasn't just a phrase in God we trust. The church was the place that you sent your kids to go to school. That's where they went to school, was in the church building. That's where they had the town meetings and the social gatherings. It was a time and a place not so long ago that the local church had a strong influence in its local community. So what has changed? What is happening? Statistics tell us that over the past 70 years, that only 40% of Americans go to church on a regular basis. But 90% believe in God we trust phrase. Prior to 2004, that stat would have stand, stood. But since then, in the last 12 years, it has went from 40% of Americans going to church on a regular basis. Guess where it's at now? 17.7% .7 of Americans go to church on a regular basis. That's what it is. And let me bring it a little closer to home. Even here at TLC, during the, the heart of summer last year, our attendance dropped by 24%. Almost a fourth of our people disappeared for the summer. So is church a priority? Does it still have the same influence that it once did? Statistics also tell us that 78 million who claim to follow Christ only go to church 12 times or less in a year. These are people that are claimed to be followers of Christ. 78 million people in America. It's projected by 2050 that the attendance in church in America will be down to 11.7% on a regular basis. Church, What's behind all the excuses? Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. 
and there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. <laughs> Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional, but grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really. You know, we see videos like that, and these are some of the strongest statistics that are out there of why people don't see the church as a guiding force. But you know, there's some other things that are out there of why we see church attendance declining. And one of the greatest things that comes to the forefront is the involvement with kids' activities. Now, I know we love our kids, but even last weekend, we had a whole slew of people in this community for a soccer tournament. Every field was filled. Every parking lot was, had a car in it, but they weren't at church. They were worshiping something else. And I know you may be saying, Pastor, you're being pretty harsh, but am I? Am I? What is the priority in America? The church needs to be there. Another statistic that came to the forefront was 42% of people said that they don't go to church anymore because it's boring. It's not relevant. It doesn't mean anything for me today. But here at TLC, we want the word to be relevant. We want it to be alive. And you know, as many as the excuses that are against being committed to church, we have that many and more reasons to be committed to the church. You know what else? Knowing the challenge that's before us. To move the church forward, we have to ask the question, are we part of the problem or part of the solution? Are we giving people a reason to say yes? Are we giving people a reason to say yes to church? And it can't just be with all the bells and whistles. The reason to say yes to church is Jesus and Jesus alone. But they had to see that in each and every one of us. Are we giving them a reason to say yes or just excuses of why we're not committed, why we're not more involved? You know, in First Peter, Peter was addressing the church, and he knew the church was under persecution, but he challenged them. He says, though there's persecution coming, stand strong, stay in the faith, continue to walk forward, stay committed. He continued to challenge them. Christians, don't worry about the threats that are coming to you. Dig deeper into the hope that you have in Christ. That's what he was telling them. Dig deeper into the hope. Don't listen to what the world has to say. In fact, in 1 Peter, if you turn with me, I'm going to begin there this morning. 1 Peter 3, verse 15, he says, Instead of the threats driving your life, he says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, Always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people ask, if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Now, when I read this, it's inspiring to me. And I hope that it's inspiring to you. 
Because the answer for the hope that we have is Jesus. Jesus died for this church. And Jesus died for you. And in dying for this church, he meant for it to be alive and to be powerful. But you know what? Statistics tell us that the church is barely alive in America. And definitely not strong. And it's time that that changes. It's time that we revitalize the power of God's spirit in the church. But when Peter was talking about this, he says, if someone asks you about the hope that you have, are you ready? I mean, if somebody would ask you on the street, what's your hope? What's your hope in? Would you get stuck and saying, going, um, uh, well, uh, uh, let me think about that for a moment. That's a good question. Or are we ready? Is it on our tongue? Is it in our heart? Are we ready to give to this world the hope that we have in Christ? They want to know why. Why do you go to church? Why do you follow this man named Jesus? Why? There are so many questions in this world, and we have the answer to it. But if we're not ready to give it, we'll just kind of step back into the shadows and not give them the hope that they can have in Christ. But the thing that I also love about what Peter was challenged in the church, he says, our life outside of the church, it may be the only testimony that anybody ever sees. So are we giving them reason to say yes to Jesus outside of these walls? When people look into our lives, are they seeing any evidence of Christ? Are they seeing any reason to say, you know what? I want to get up Sunday. Instead of going to this, that, or the other, I want to go with you to church. Are we giving them any reason to say yes? Or are we the ones who are going, you know, I've got to go to church today. God, i got to go. You don't have to do anything. But if you want to know the hope in Christ, then you'll want to get up. You'll want to come and experience everything that he has for us. You know, we talk a lot about the Great Commission here at TLC. And we want to live that out. We want to go to the ends of the earth, reaching as many as possible. But to be an attractive church, bringing in newcomers, we have to give them a reason to say yes. Because they're saying yes to a lot of things in the church. So I did some studying on this. You know, churches seem to attract the newcomers based on certain characteristics. And as I looked at this one book entitled, Why People Don't Go to Church, there were five things that were present in the churches that were attracting newcomers. I want to go over them just briefly with you. The first one was this. A church has a sense of vision and direction. But it's not just about vision and direction. What the book goes on to say is those newcomers stay because they see the attenders that are there committed to the vision and direction. You know, I could get up here and, and paint a great vision, but if nobody follows, nobody's committed to it, then how great is the vision? I mean, I look at what we just accomplished with the paving the way. There was a vision, and you guys were committed to it, and now it's become a reality. That's what this community is going to see. They're going to see the evidence of Christ being lived out. The second characteristic is where leaders empower attenders, meaning that we truly become the hands and feet of Christ. Imagine that. That you're not just pew sitters, that you actually are active living out your faith because we equip you and empower you to do so. But the third characteristic that I think is one of the most important is that attenders invite others. In a healthy church, attenders, you guys, are inviting others. And when that happens, it becomes contagious. Those people will see that you are reaching out beyond yourself, at work, in your neighborhood, wherever you're at, at the grocery store, and you're reaching out and saying, you need to come to my church. But you give them a reason why. You give them the hope that you have in Christ. Another characteristic is a strong encounter with Jesus in worship. We have to be able to encounter Jesus. I don't want you to just come and sing a few songs. I want you to engage with the creator of the universe. And if that means putting a hand up, then put a hand up. If that means clapping, then clap. But engage with our creator. Don't sit back and just watch. He didn't create you to just watch and observe. He created you to engage. And if we have that, it will be contagious for those that walk through this door. They will say, I want what you have. Show me the way. And the last characteristic that comes out of this book is growth in faith and movement toward commitment. Growth in faith and movement toward commitment. And what it was talking about is that when newcomers 
come and they hear the testimonies and the reports of the attenders saying, let me tell you what Christ has done in my life. They're sitting there going, maybe there's something to this Jesus. It's not just some guy up on the stage that's talking too long. But it's you living it out. You know what I call that? E-G-S. Encounter, grow, serve. Why do you think I push so hard for you guys to share your encountering with God? How you're growing in your faith and how you're living out your faith by serving. When we do this, people see the evidence of our faith lived out. And the church is alive. The church is powerful. And that's what he called us to be. You know, there are, there are ways that we can look at the church. And are we given the... This community and beyond, are we giving them a reason to say yes? Are we living out the great commission that he's put before us? And are we opening the doors into the life of anybody that we walk into, inviting them in? Or are we going to begin to guard ourselves against the world as if there's no hope for them? See, the title of the message today is A Guide or a Guard. I believe God has called us as a church to be a guide. But so many times we put ourselves in a position of guarding. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. I want to talk to you about when the church stands in the way of open doors. When the church stands in the way of open doors. You know, we as a church say we have open doors. Come to TLC, we have open doors. But the world differs. They said, that's not true. The church does not have open doors for us who are broken. You know, we may have open doors, church. but We often stand guard. We really do. We stand guard against the lost. We stand guard against the different. We stand guard against the broken. Too messy. We stand guard against growth and change in our convenience and our own wants and desires. This is my church. How dare you come in and change it? Since when did you take ownership to this? This is not your church. It's not my church. And the evidence of of Christ needs to be seen in all of this. Church, let me give you the 411 on this. You didn't die for this church. And you're not coming back for this church. Who is? Is Christ. It is his church. He is the head. He is the ruler. And he is the life giver. And if the church is to be alive, then we have to let him lead. And he has to guide us in the direction that we are to go. But see, in the church in America... Why I believe that it's fading is because we've made it all about us. It's all about our comfort, all about our needs and our wants. You know, why do we think we can determine who can come to church and pass judgment on people that Jesus died for? Now, you may be saying, now, Pastor, you're getting a little harsh on us. Am I? We size people up pretty well, don't we? We size them up before they even enter. And when they're here, we still size them up and we pass judgment. But that person, just like me, Jesus died for. And who are we to pass judgment on this? Now, when you look into Romans chapter 1, Paul is really addressing the church because he's saying there's something happening here. The church is, is influencing the world, but yet the world is influencing the church. And what Paul is trying to say, he's saying, going, man, there's a lot of corruption in the world. I get it. It's an understatement. Paul knew what was happening. But Paul was really trying to get them to see that this message of hope is being watered down. This message of hope is being suppressed and put aside. And so many times in the church we think it's about us. And the Jews even thought that. This message is first for us. The Jews is for us. We don't want to give it to anybody else. We're the chosen people of God. But Paul and Jesus comes in and says, you know what? No. It may be for you first, but it's all for all mankind. And they goes in and, and he talks about saying, this is for the Gentiles. Now, if you don't know a lot about the Gentiles, that was not something that the Jews were quick, quickly going to give up something that was theirs to the Gentiles. That was, it's ours. We don't want to give it to the Gentiles. And Jesus says, not only for the Gentiles, it's for all. That was something that was radically different than anything that they ever heard before. And I feel like that today when I say the love of Jesus is for anybody. Sometimes I feel like that's radical in the church because we say, well, yeah, it's for some. When they get their life right, it's for them. No, the love of Jesus is for all. Even in their midst of sin, his love is there for them. 
But sometimes we forget that. But you know, he goes on and talks about his obligation. Paul says, I'm obligated to the good news. And I'm obligated to share the message to anyone that will listen. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I will go out and I will give it to anybody that will listen. Lend me an ear. Paul goes on to say, you know what? God is known. And God has been made known through creation and through his truth. But yet, even in all the evidence of God, Paul says people still refuse to believe in him. Now, why is that? He says many have moved from worshiping God, the creator of the universe, to worshiping everything but God, animals, themselves, creation. He says when you suppress the truth of God, Wickedness finds its way into our lives and even into the life of the church. You know, Paul explains that this distortion and corruption happens to humanity apart from God. He says it's no surprise that you separate yourself from God. Corruption, distortion, wickedness is going to come in. That's the sin nature. So many times we forget about that. But Paul says, let me tell you something. And he addresses some things pretty specific in Scripture. And sometimes we want to skip over it. Sometimes we want to soften it up. But he goes and he says, you know, let me tell you. What's happening is idol worship. It's extreme. But not only in idol worship, there's all other kinds of distortion that is going on. He says people are engaging in sexually distorted relationships driven by the lust of the flesh. Yes, homosexual relationships is what Paul was talking about. And he says they are not of God. They're not of God. And you know, in that moment, we can say, man, I can see the anger of God. Preach it, pastor. And we're willing to point our fingers at certain and specific sins as if they're less than anything that we've brought to the table. It's not. It is absolutely not. In fact, Paul goes on and says, you know what? It doesn't end there. When you suppress the truth, you're not off the hook. Because what he wants us to realize is that apart from God, our sinful nature will rule. That is the truth. And in fact, he goes on. If you turn with me to Romans, the first chapter, verse 28, after he just laid this out, he goes on and he says these words. He says, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that they should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malice behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Now, when Paul lays this out, I can imagine that there's a lot of Christians going, sitting there going, go, preach it, Paul. I'm sure glad I'm not like them. I'm sure glad you're not talking about me. Homosexuality, gossip, no different in the eyes of God. It is sin. And when we suppress the truth, Sin can find its way into our life and manifest itself however it chooses. But whatever it chooses is to take us away from God. That's what sin is about, is breaking our relationship with God. And the church needs to be a guide. But yet we spend so much time guarding. You know, it's easy for us to judge and look down on certain sins and place a severity score on it. We do it all the time. How foolish is this? You know, we guard and say, we've got to guard our church. We, we don't want that influence in here. We create these holy huddles and we gather together. We're inclusive and say, if we stay together and keep the world away from us, we'll be what the church is supposed to be. Wrong. What the church is supposed to be is a light. What the church is supposed to be is break into darkness. What the church is supposed to be is an open door for those that are lost. But so many times... We're so quick to close the doors. And even if they're open, we'll stand in them. Put our arms out and say, you're welcome, maybe. Are they welcome or not? 
That's what we have to ask this morning. Are they welcome or not? You know, we say we don't want those type of people here. Who? Sinners? Well, guess what? <laughs> We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And every one of us is a sinner in need of a Savior. Not a one of us can stand alone without Christ. We have to have Christ in this. But when you look at this, we're so good at justifying our actions. We'll even say, Pastor, it's our responsibility as a church to guard, right? We've got to protect the church. I'll tell you, yeah, we're supposed to guard. You know what we're supposed to guard? The truth. We're supposed to guard the truth that it's not watered down. We're supposed to guard the truth that it's not distorted. But guard against the lost? Never. We're never to guard against it. We're always to welcome them. So many times we can't. But you know, what I love about Paul, he loved the church so much that he was willing to speak truth to him. And I'm so in love with the church that I'm going to speak truth to you. In chapter 2, he addresses the church after all this was laid out. Listen to these words. You may think you can condemn such people but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself, for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you, you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? I mean, do we even hear the words of God when these words are spoken? Paul is addressing the church and saying, why are you so quick to condemn all these people when you yourself are doing the very same thing? You want to pick and choose what is okay sin, what is an acceptable sin, an acceptable sin? Are you kidding me? There is no acceptable sin. But yet we live that way, church. If you gossip, okay, we'll, we'll work with you. But if you do this, that, or the other, no way. You're not welcome here. That is not of the Lord. I'm sorry. That is not the word being lived out in grace and mercy. We have to love them where they're at. You know, we actually think it's our place to judge. How foolish is that? You know, I love how Paul says it. When he addresses, he says, you church, you have no excuse. You know Christ. You know the truth. But yet you continue to sin. The people that you're condemning don't know the truth. And you're condemning them? He says, you have no excuse, church. So we have to get it right with the Lord. Get it under the blood. And live it through the mercy and grace of God. Because if we don't accept that, and live in that, we will not give it to others. But I love verses 4 and 5 in this. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? I mean, think about it. In my sin, it wasn't just once. In my sin, my life has been a lifeline of sin. But he's been patient with me. And he says, doesn't this mean anything to you when you look at other people's sin? Don't you understand the kindness of God is to draw you out? And if we understand the kindness of God, why would we not extend that to others? To give them grace. The same saving grace that was given to us. Church has to be extended to those around us. The why behind the need for the church to guide. Final point. The why. The why for the need for the church to guide. Not guard. You know, even in the Old Testament, the church was, a, was, a, was not established yet. But God's people were still living in such a way to bring honor and glory to God. And in Isaiah, I want you to turn with me, Isaiah 58, there is a beautiful portrait here of what I believe can still be a portrait for the church today. They were living out their faith. Maybe they weren't called the church, but they were the church. They were the people of God. And when we guide this world, it can look a lot of different ways, but we have to be willing to take whatever's in front of us. In verse 7, it says, Share your food with the hungry, 
and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. I think we probably all need help on that one. We like to hide from our relatives. But then he goes on. He says, Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Listen to this reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. And the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Is that not a beautiful picture of what the church should be? It absolutely is. That's what the church should be. And in this challenge that came from Isaiah, he's talking about moving forward. He's talking about removing oppression. How many people do you know that live in oppression? We can give them the freedom in Christ to relieve them from the oppression. And he says, in doing so, you will be renewed in your strength so that you can strengthen others. This is an ongoing cycle that God has for his church, is to be active in moving this. But everything, everything that we do, church, everything we should do guides everybody. Even a glass of water is to be given in the name of Christ. Everything that we do should guide them to Jesus because Jesus is the why. He's always been the why. Jesus needs to be at the forefront of why we do what we do. And if Jesus is guiding us and directing us, our church is going to look a lot different. But church, the guidance has to start within. We can't expect ourselves to guide this world if we're not willing to guide each other here within the church. The church has to be strengthened. And in Galatians 6, Paul goes on. In Galatians 6, 1, he says, Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, if any believer is overcome by sin, kick them out of church. That's not what it says. But that's what we want to say sometimes. What it says is, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful to not fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Jesus has to be the priority. But church, I'm going to tell you, being a preacher's kid, living in the church all my life, there's a lot of churches out there that think that the church is about them. Not Jesus. But here at TLC, I'm going to tell you, I will fight for this church. And I will continue to fight to make Christ the head of this church. And I will challenge you to follow me as I follow Christ. He needs to be the one that's guiding and directing us. But he goes on, he says, why we do this is so that we can share each other's burdens. How can you guide somebody that you don't know? You can't guide them unless you get involved in their lives. He says, you need to learn to carry each other's burdens. In church, our value does not come from what we do. Our value comes from who we are in Christ. In fact, I love how Hebrews puts this, a great challenge in front of us. In Hebrews 10, it says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. In God we trust? Sound familiar? 90% of Americans agree to this statement, in God we trust. But by 2050, 11.7% will go to church on a regular basis. There's a problem, don't you think? And we've got to come back to this. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Do we understand the urgency that is before us? Do we understand what God has called us to? We've got to see this. He says, don't stop meeting together. Don't waver from the hope and the truth that you have. But when we have 24% of our congregation disappear in the summer, 
You know what I call that? Wavering. I'm all about vacations. But I don't know too many people that can take 90-day vacation and get paid for it. If you can, come talk to me. I'd love to figure that one out. But we need to keep Christ as the priority. The church is part of our lives. It's not something we do. It's who we are. The church is not an institution. It's the people of God. And if we are continuing to be the guide to the world, then the church has to stay together. How can we find a peace about the future? We can have peace about the future knowing the future and knowing the one who holds the future. And I'm going to leave you with one last poll that was taken about this whole premise of peace and well-being. It talks about people wanting to find peace. And out of this list, there's about 25 things that people consider, this will give you peace about your future, about a state of well-being. Out of that 25, the first one, which 89% of the people said, this brings me peace, is time with family. Okay, I can understand that. I love my family. I don't know if they give me peace all the time, but I love my family, (laughs) all right? I love my family. But the second thing was time with friends. Gives you peace and a state of well-being about your future. But as you look down the list, you kind of get down towards the middle of this, and it says 52% say that working gives me peace about my future in a state of well-being. And right underneath that, 48% is time spent in the bush. Now, how many people spend time in the bush? I don't know. Anybody here? I don't think so. But it's there. Time in the bush. I'm sitting there going, I'm not even sure if I understand what that fully means. I think it has something to do with going somewhere that's, I don't know. It's out there somewhere. By yourself. But then you reach down, you reach and you say, okay, where's God in all of this? I mean, surely God is in this, right? That God is the one who brings peace about our future and a state of well-being? It's not down until 29% of the people say, prayer. Prayer brings me peace about my future and about a state of well-being. And then all the way down at the bottom, just under watching sports is attending church. Just under watching sports Church brings me a state of well-being and a peace about my future. Now, how sad is that? It's very sad. So are we a guide or a guard? And if we are a guide, then we need to start showing people the way to the Lord. We need to start opening our mouths and start being the hands and feet of Christ everywhere we go. That's what he's called us to. So church, I need you to walk with me. Not just this summer. I need you to walk with me for the rest of the days of our lives together as we guide and not guard. Guard the word, yes, but not guard against. It needs to get messy in here. These chairs need to be filled with people that are lost, and we need to guide them because we have the answer. Christ is the answer. Let's pray.